I'm here to talk about a story that started 40 years ago, approximately, and has actually extended right up to the present. Um, my wife and I, as newlyweds, went to Bangladesh in 1977 and, fairly, and uh, fit into the existing MCC agricultural program in Bangladesh. Before I go too far, I need to explain a few things about seasonal agriculture in Bangladesh. Um, there are two main seasons, maybe not officially, I will call them the rainy season and the dry season. During the rainy season, Bangladesh receives anywhere from 80 to 100 inches of water. Just for comparison's sake, here in Manitoba we get about 50, 10 to 15 inches of water during our summer. I should also say that Bangladesh is about the same latitude as Florida and so the weather is warm year round. During the summer, the, during the, our s summer, the rainy season, uh, the heat is dampened somewhat by the, uh, by the very, very strong rains. The result of the rains is that Bangladesh, which is relatively flat, is practically flooded from, co from coast to mountain. And the only things that are, that are standing up dry are roads and houses. The fields are flooded, and so because of the huge amounts of water, the, the preferred f crops during the rainy season are crops like rice and jute, which love water. Starting in September, the rain drops off completely, and the season from October until March is bone dry. It's the, um, the country which was flooded in the summertime becomes dry, 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 like a desert. And that has direct implications for what our work was, what the, the MCC agricultural work was. Uh, the efforts mainly were to provide additional food production in that very dry season. So here's a, here's a picture which shows several things. It shows a man plowing his field during the dry season, obviously it's very dry, there's no water available. His tools and implements are extremely s simple. Here we have two, two head of cattle, um, tiny by North American standards, and uh, the equipment contains a, a, um, includes a bamboo pole as the, as the yoke, a wooden um, uh, draw, draw stem, or whatever you want to call it, and there's a small, there's a small uh, metal shear at the bottom. Uh, the, size, the size of the fields are small. Uh, here we tend to deal with, um, with field sizes or farm sizes as, as uh, numbers of quarter sections. In Bangladesh, a very common uh, field size or even land holding is less than two acres with, with, with fields smaller than that making up that total. This is a, what I would consider a typical Bangladeshi family. Uh, most of the people are Muslim, uh, which didn't really make much difference to our work. But the man's name is Sadiq, and he's a very special person. Uh, during the three months of language training in Bangladesh, we stayed with this family in their village for a week, so that we had some kind of um, some kind of dropping in on the, on the local culture and, um, and uh, ways of doing things. So this is a fairly, as I say, is a fairly common family. The houses are uh, bamboo or other, other wooden framed with mud sides, and you can't see it here, but if uh, the person is relatively well-to-do, he would have a corrugated iron roof or if not, then, th then that would be thatch. So, uh, very early on in my, uh, in my stay there in Bangladesh, uh, the people in the ag program said, George, we would like you to develop a better hand pump. And so, uh, just to put that into, into context, uh, cast iron pumps, like the one you see here, have been available through Government programs, uh, some of you maybe may know how this, how this pump works. I'm not going to describe it in detail. Basically, the pump is operated like this. Inside here, there's a, there's a, there's a piston 
which drops back and forth like this. There's a foot valve in here. If anything goes wrong with that pump, it is a real problem to get at the working parts and to, and to, and to maintain it. So one of the goals in terms of designing a better hand pump would be to, uh, to first of all, it has to be durable because these things are going to be used uh, for many hours in a day, but also to make any maintenance that's required easier than with this pump. Uh, I'm going, just going to step back a little bit more before we get into the pump um, itself. Fortunately for us, the groundwater conditions in Bangladesh are very favorable. Groundwater is plentiful and generally very clean. Uh, also, the technology for drilling wells and what we were using, what we were, we were using this on was, was inch and a half, two wells, which were sunk into the ground down to wherever the water is, was, um, was available. And here you see a crew of men who have come in and are in, the, are in the process of drilling a well. These wells, typically, typically what happens is the farmer will make payment for, a, for a, a pump and well. In the morning, the crew will come in with all of their materials. The farmer will, will be asked, where do, you want, where do you want this well? And he'll, he'll point anywhere. There's no water witching or anything. He says, I want my well right here. They set up their, the, their equipment. They work during the day. At the end of the day, end of one day, they will be finished drilling the well, putting the, the, the screen in, putting the, the pipe in, attaching the pump at the top, developing the well, and everything is functional after one day. So uh, now let's just talk a little bit about, about the pump itself. What you see here is the pump. Uh, one of the uh, one of the, the key features that I, that I sought to achieve was simplicity. So the basic operation of the pump is the same as this pump in that you have a foot valve and a, and a piston valve operating, op opening and closing at opposite times, and you have a reciprocating um, action in the cylinder. A big difference is that I eliminated the, the levered handle so the pump operates directly, which does, which does several things. First of all, this is a very, a very comfortable way of operating a pump as opposed to uh, operating le like this. Uh, secondly, access to all of the pumps, to, sorry, to all of the parts is very, very easy. There's no bolts to undo. To get access to the piston, you pull it out, you got it get access to the foot valve, there's this one tool. Here's the foot valve. I'll explain it separately. So this one tool, one of which is supplied with each pump, is used to, to retrieve and to reinsert, reinsert the foot valve. So you push it back into place. Down at the bottom, the, uh, the cylinder has, has a, uh, a taper in it, and the foot valve slides into that taper until it seats, and then it seals against the cylinder. The, uh, and just to, just to finish this up, as before, the reverse of before, the piston goes back in here. <clears throat> okay, so just, um, so you saw within a, within a few seconds, within, within minutes, the foot valve and the piston, both of the moving parts of the pump can be removed very, very easily with, with the one tool. Now I'd like to show you uh, the details of, of uh, some of this. Here's, uh, here's the same foot valve as you saw in there. The two, the, the two parts that could go wrong, or that could require maintenance, <laughs> okay, let me start with this one. The valve itself is made up of inner tube rubber, 
And it simply, it simply pulls off like this. If you need to replace it, you take inner tube, cut a circle with a hole in the center, pop it back on here, and you're set. The seal, the rubber seal over here, simply sits in this groove. Anyway, so this pops out, seems to be a little bit tighter. This pops out and, and, and is, is, is easily replaced. The piston has a similar uh, valve in it. Here are the parts of the uh, piston. The main part is a stiffener for the valve. Some people think that it looks like the, uh, the disc in a sausage maker, which is, which is quite an astute observation. Basically, there is a uh, leather seal around here like this. There's a support plate in the back. Again, the same, the same valve. Got this upside down, of course. This spins onto the piston here like this. Attach that with a pin and it's done. So let me just say a few things about um, about the, um, the pump. This is a brand new design uh, using brand new materials, uh, basically PVC pipe as opposed to cast iron. And before we could do any decent marketing of this, we had to know, first of all, that the uh, pump was going to be durable. There was a concern that PVC as a relatively soft material was not gonna last. So we did very extensive testing out in the field Here's an example here of uh, a pump that is set up, in this case, close to a rice field. And basically, this fellow operates that pump continuously for days at a time. Uh, we did that with several pumps installed in different places. We didn't have accurate measurement or instruments to measure wall thickness, but I cut a few of those pumps out apart in the in the middle I could not detect any difference in the wall thickness all I, all I could see was a very keen polishing of the inside edge of the of the cylinder so we we're quite ha happy with that uh, we also did output tests and we found with the surge chamber that uh, a person could pump 50 percent more water with this pump than with the old pumps uh, price wise uh, these, these pumps with, with the Wells uh, complete package were also c considerably less than the cast iron pumps. And uh, so after, after about uh, 18 months, uh, we put in some test pumps and then after that monitored what was happening in the field and slowly built up the, uh, the marketing. In 1986, uh, my wife and I returned to Bangladesh to, do, to work on a marketing project with International Development Enterprises. We were there for two years, and uh, the work has continued. Uh, here is, um, just want to point out a few, a few examples here. Here are three pumps installed in the field. This, this pump is irrigating leafy vegetables. I'm not sure whether that's broccoli or cauliflower. Uh, this person is um, irrigating eggplant. And this happens to be set up close to a, to a rice field. Uh, you, can see, you can see from the, uh, uh, the girl here who's carrying a, a little a pot that the pump is used for both irrigation purposes and for domestic uses, since the water is very clean compared to what they would have otherwise. Uh, here's a part that I, we, we may want to insert earlier, and that is, here is, a, here is a drawing showing how the pump, how the pump is located in the field. Um, although the pump is inclined at an angle, and that happens to be 30 degrees, which was found to be a 
a comfortable angle from horizontal, but there's a Y connection here and the actual well going, going into the ground is vertical. This, this pipe here is shown with breaks in it because it would be way off, way off the edge of the picture if I drew the whole thing. Uh, the length from here to here in the area where we were working in Noah Kali was between 50 and 60 feet. And then at the bottom there was a, a strainer or a filter, whatever you want to call it, attached there to allow the water to, uh, to go into the, into the tube well and keep the, the sand outside. So that's a very typical op um, application. Um, you see this, uh, here's also a little bit of a mock-up about how, how this was set up. The end was supported with a crisscross of bamboo sticks. And actually most of this was covered with a, with a mound of, of soil. And the soil is there to not only steady the pump in operation, but also help prevent theft. These, these pumps became quite valuable and if they were left out in the field overnight, in the morning you might come, on, come back and there's no pump. So I think I should also mention the, uh, the economics of this kind of uh, irrigation technology is, uh, technology is phenomenal. Um, as I mentioned, the, uh, the total cost of installation for a pump, and it depends with the depth, uh, is in the vicinity of $100. On a half acre of land, with the farmer donating his labor, but with a half acre of land, the crops from one winter season was enough to pay off all of the crop inputs and the cost of the well and the pump, which I think in anybody's books would be phenomenal. Um, and in addition, the benefits to the family in terms of clean drinking water were also sizable. We never, we never tried to put a, a value on that, a dollar of value on that, but that is a, 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 a considerable additional benefit. We started with zero pumps, uh, none of the pumps were given away free, even from the start. Uh, our first year, our first year, we had about a 50% subsidy just to help get them introduced. After that, uh, I think the I think the second year was was l less than that, and after that, the pumps were sold at, at complete cost. Um, a, f a colleague of mine, Aloise Miller from Switzerland, who worked with us on the pump came to visit us in Carmen in 2014. He had been back, he has continued to work uh, internationally in various projects. He had visited Bangladesh recently, and from his looking around at uh, what was happening with the pumps, the production of the pumps had moved from one workshop, which is what was happening when I left, to many workshops. Some were producing the full pump, some were producing parts. His estimate was that by 2014, 500,000 of these pumps had been installed in Bangladesh. Now, number of pumps is one thing. We know that each one of those pumps, now this has a family of, uh, there's actually five children, so that's seven people in all. Taking an average family of five, 500,000 times five equals two and a half million people directly uh, benefiting from, from these pumps. And these are all purchased. These are, not, these are not giveaways. So, and the overall, personally, uh, I've been involved in uh, various irrigation and water projects in my, in my career. I consider this to be the highlight of my career. George, you come from an engineering background with a degree in engineering. Um, can you give us a little bit of the background of how you ended up uh, in this process of developing a well and having that as a very practical tool for, um, for Bangladesh? Well, let me go back a little bit. My first, uh, my first term of service with MCC was as a new uh, Bachelor of Science graduate. I went to Nigeria to teach for three years uh, in, a, in a high school. And I taught physics and mathematics. I when I was there, I kind of sat back and I said, okay, George, what are you going to do next? And so I thought about various things and I said, you know, I think I have a, contribu a contribution to make in the international context. And this is going to sound weird, 
But I wanted to do something a little more practical than teaching. Like, it's true that by teaching you, you, you help and you motivate and you, and you equip many more people than, than you work with an, with an individual product. <laughs> but I kind of went the opposite way and I said, I want to be able to come and do something practical directly. Yeah. And so I went back into, into, into university and I studied and I graduated with, with an agricultural engineering degree specifically to do this. Okay, okay. So, so you have that, that uh, kind of technical training. Yes, but I, I have to also say for this project, I had never taken a course in well drilling. I had never, I had never taken a course in hand pumps. I had, I had learned the technical stuff. How do you, how do you, um, what do you call it? It's, um, it's almost like, it's almost like, it isn't stargazing. It's, um, oh, what's the word? Uh, it's brainstorming. How do you brainstorm in terms of, of solving a problem? And then how do you work with, your, with, the, with the various ideas and come up with an actual product? I mean, the, the word design also has many meanings. Uh, for uh, interior designers, design means something that's pretty and attractive. This thing did not have to be pretty and attractive. This had to work. <laughs> and it had to work for a long time. So I have, I have just one little thing that which I meant to show before. Um, you can't see, because of the nature of the plastic here, you can't see how the, how the valves actually work. I have made up a little, little uh, uh, cylinder sample which, where you can actually see it. So I'm not sure how, how well this is going to show up, but I can show you. So I have, I have the foot valve in place and kind of a makeshift piston with the, same, with the same valves here. And if you look here, every time I, I pull on it, you see this valve open a little bit like a fish, fish gill. That's where the water comes out. And conversely, you can't see it because it's moving. The same thing ha happens here. This, in looking back, uh, both Eloise have realized that we didn't only design a pump. We revolutionized, in some ways, pump design. Some of the ideas here, this is, this is, this is called a direct action pump because the action is directly to the, to the piston. You don't have any mechanism on top. You don't have a wheel, you don't have a pulley, you don't have a lever, whatever. So uh, this is a confirmation that a direct action pump actually works for your, even for irrigation. And then the, the uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as I said before, this, this is one of the simplest valves in the world. And <laughs> cheap. <laughs> yeah, no like you have in, in pumps, you have fancy, even, even this pump has a, it's, it's, it's called, um, I forgot the name of it, but basically it has a hole, it has a hole in the piston, and then there's a weight that, um, um, that, that falls down to seal, and then it, it bobs up, bobs up to open. So, uh, as soon as, whenever you have something that's going up and down and hitting as the surface, you're giving a chance for wear and, and, um, and malfunction. This, uh, <laughs> this is, but, but the whole thing, all of the things that we have included, I, and I haven't talked about the search chamber, the search chamber is another innovation. Um, these are things that are simple in the end. But it's not a simple path getting to them. <laughs> I do also want to, want to do a little bit of, maybe not so much marketing, but a chance for, for further, further information. This year, I have written a book on the whole, I mean, there are, there are 100 pages worth of other information from what I have said here. So this book is now available. It's called, We Would Like You to Design a Better Hand Pump. And I'm the author. This is self-published. 
It is available here at the Mennonite Heritage, uh, Men Mennonite Heritage Village, uh, both in person and by request. It will be mailed out to you. But it's published by lulu.com, L-U-L-U.com, and the book is available both in uh, um, paperback or hardcover. So I just wanted to expand a little bit on the, uh, on the comment I made before. Uh, this represents an established technology. We basically followed up on that technology. We made some changes. For instance, instead of using metal pipe, which is very expensive and very heavy and hard to, to, uh, to transport, we used PVC pipe in, in the well and in the strainer, reducing costs and making it much, much, much easier to, uh, to transport. We also did some other things in terms of an enlarged, enlarged hole and that kind of stuff. I, I thought at the time that some expatriate, some, some foreigner, maybe 100 years came up and, 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 and introduced this. But as, as I understand now, I checked up on it, and I understand that this was, this was a technology that was already established uh, maybe a century ago or more, maybe several centuries in India. And when I imagine this, they didn't have inch and a half GI pipe at the time or, or, or PVC. So they may have used hollowed out bamboo, who knows? So the way this works is, as I said, the crew comes in, and the crew consists of three people, these three people, some lengths of bamboo. Here's a cross piece bamboo. Unfortunately, it's just kind of in line with the, with the mustard in the back there. But there's cross, cross pieces here. This is, the, this is what will eventually be the actual tube well. But that pipe is being used to drill the well. And the way it's done is this fellow here has a short bamboo pole that rests on this cross piece and with a chain is attached to this pipe. So he is rocking that pole like this. And with the result that this pipe here is going up and down like this. And there's, there's, a, there's a knack to it. I, I haven't tried to do it because I'd, I'd make a mess of it. They know how to do it. The guy on the top, oh sorry, before they can actually function, unfortunately this picture is, is cut off, but the guys will drill a little, a little basin, catch, catch basin, maybe three feet across, maybe a foot deep, and before, before they start drilling, they'll bring in some, some water and fill that up. So that, and it is, it, it, as the hole is drilled, it'll go down into the, in, in, into the hole with, with the pipe. As these guys are popping this up and down, this fellow on the top here, and he would not meet safety code here in Canada. <laughs> he's just perched up there like a parrot, but he knows what he's doing, and he's using his hand as a valve. So that on the upstroke, the valve is closed so that the water in this pipe, I have to start so somewhere, uh, there's water in the pipe, and so on the upstroke, the water comes up with the pipe. On the downstroke, the, the, the pipe goes down, and so the water that was up here falls down. And so you start up with a, a cycle. The water is coming in the, in the, in, in, up through the pipe. It falls down the hole, falls down into the hole, loosens up the dirt, the soil, and comes up back up the pipe again, and you have, you have, a, you have a continuous cycle going. Now this is, this is dirty water. Which is, which, is, which is the intention, because it's carrying the soil up with it. The, the soil that it is cutting is coming up with the, with the water. It falls out here, so occasionally they have to scoop that out, maybe fill up some more water, and away they go. It's an amazing system. And as, as I said, they may, do, they may go down 60 feet. And what we did, this is, this is actually one of the advantages of using the, the PVC pipe, we actually had them, instead of uh, fitting and unfitting, or disconnecting and, and disconnecting uh, the pipes as they, as, they, as they went down and then, and, then, and then up again, we had them actually uh, um, glue the pipes together. So you might have 60 feet of pipe that go up, like 60 feet is what, like a six-story building? It's, it's huge. So they pull this thing up, and this thing will eventually bend and come down in a, a huge arc, all in one piece, like that, 
And then they will take the, like the, the, the last end, the, the drilling end is usually a, a metal pipe to keep it straight. They'll take that off, add the strainer, put it right back all the way down in one piece, and then they'll get some sand and stuff and fill it in, and away they go. Just amazing. That's and they'll, well. it's yeah. done. By the end of the day, it's done. 60 feet. And so I actually, uh, not only is this amazing, but it also illustrates how, uh, how, aquifer uh, how aquifers are different around the world. If you were to drill, even in many parts of India, or in Africa for sure, in many places you would be drilling through aggregate for sure, like gravel, maybe even solid rock. And any well might cost you like five thousand or ten thousand dollars because it's it, it, it's so hard to drill. Here it's fifty bucks, and it, and it produces employment. <laughs> and so, there, so in in Bangladesh there isn't that that aggregate or no. or bedrock kind of. That's Bangladesh is a country that has been formed as a delta. The rivers coming from the Himalayan mountains in India and Nepal, Tibet probably, whatever, some major rivers flowing through this delta and discharging into the Bay of Bengal have over the centuries brought down all of this alluvial material, all of this silt, silt and a little bit of sand. And so that, is, that has deposited, making for a, almost a perfectly flat country and drilling is like the Stones here, especially in the Steinbach, Steinbach area, <laughs> area, can be a problem. I grew up on a farm not a few mi miles from here, and one of the, one of the least, least attractive jobs every year was to pick stones and pull out stones. So here stones are a problem. There they're scarce. They're, they're, they actually need to either for, like, for building bricks, or for, for making bricks to build, uh, build houses, or instead of gravel for a road, they have to first of all bake bricks and then break them up to make gravel-sized chunks. So it illustrates how scarce rocks are. And no, I have, I, I've never heard of, I mean, of course, I have been at every, every well site. There are a few places where the soil is quite heavy. It's a heavy clay soil. Uh, like the, we have uh, w w west of, of, of Steinbach, and uh, they can still do this, but it just takes longer to do it. There, there instead of the soil coming up as, 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 as dirty water, it actually comes up like a core, core of soil, and eventually comes out like a, like a piece of sausage or whatever. Yeah. So George, has this uh, type of pump been used elsewhere in the world? Yes, uh, I, I have kind of lost track of it. Uh, in my book, I, um, I, I made a, or people with IDE made a list. I'll just refer to it. In the back, I, I have a chart here of uh, the status of rower pump installations as of 1986. There's about 20 countries listed. And the number of the number of pumps in each um, each each country, Bangladesh is by far by by far the biggest because of the the very su suitable groundwater. Because at that time there were twenty three thousand installed, and the next biggest country was actually Somalia. At three hundred and twenty, and Nepal at two hundred and twenty, but the others. Bolivia, Burkina Faso, Faso Chad, uh, other countries, they're small, like single digits. But the, the, uh, the ideas, the ideas in this pump have gone into other, on a number of other pumps, which are not included in this list. In fact, for those people who have followed the pump uh, situation in Bangladesh, as I, I explained it in, in the book, um, another, when we were there, it turned out to be a kind of a, kind of a renaissance or a, maybe a um, golden age for, for hand pumps for irrigation 
There was another pump. There's actually two other pumps that were that were developed. One one is also a a direct action pump. It was installed vertically, and it was, but it was installed uh, mainly for uh, domestic purposes. So it didn't have to be necessarily very comfortable, and it went a, a little bit deeper as well. I don't know what the numbers are. I think that it has been reasonably successful, but not anywhere close to these these numbers. There's another pump called the treadle pump, which 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 was happening just exactly the same time as this one was. I was no I had no idea that that it was going on until I heard about it, and then I checked it out, and I ha I have a picture of the early ones. It's, it actually is a foot-operated pump, which has some advantages in that, in that the foot muscles, the, the leg muscles are stronger than your arm muscles. But it's a, it's a dual, it's a dual uh, piston pump, and it had a superstructure of bamboo, which, which it, because you had to have a lever to do all of the, all of the work. It was, it, it, it was actually a very, very successful pump. But I don't see, I don't see any of these as being competitors. In fact, in, in, I think it was 1985, representatives from the three pumps got together and ended up agreeing that all three of them would use the, uh, the pump design or the, the valve design from the rower pump. So these are all cousins or sisters, whatever you want to call them. And each of them had their own application. Uh, this, uh, the rower pump was for, was for a relatively long pipe length 50 feet on the average with water tables of 5, 10, 15, 20 feet. The treadle pump uh, worked in a situation, interesting enough, in the northern part of the country where you had maybe 15 feet of pipe and, and they used bamboo because it was, it, was so, it was so easy to get to the water, it was almost like scooping it out. And the water table was very close to the surface. So different conditions, different tools. And they all, they're, they're all related in their DNA, DNA, actually. So I didn't talk about the operation of the surge chamber. The surge chamber in suction pumps is practically, on the suction side of a pump is practically unknown as far as I can tell. It is used on the pressure side of the pump to even out the flow for when, say, you're using a cast iron pump to pump water to an over, uh, uh, a rooftop container. Um, I included this because I looked at what was happening with the water column. And I'm going to point to this, to this diagram here. There's a water column which might be 50 or 60 feet long. Every time the pump cylinder pulls on that water column, this water goes up. Then on the return stroke, stroke it stops. So there is this intermittent flow, upward flow of this water column, which to me is, a, is something that you can, that you can, um, you can change to make the pump easier and faster to operate. And what happens here, is assume this is your water column, The search chamber is attached to, directly to that water column. The pump here draws water out of it. So I have to start somewhere. There's no valves down here. This is, this is free and easy. The only valve is, in, is in, the, in the pump. So when the pump draws from here, it will draw water. I have to start here somewhere. So in mid-stroke here, in... in um, when the, when the pump is not operating, there's water to about this level. There's water up to about here. This is a partial vacuum. So when the pump pulls, the, uh, the pump takes water both from the cylinder and from this. It pulls up. When the, when the foot valve closes, when the pump returns, this valve is closed, but you have an in increased vacuum in this bulb so it continues to draw water up in the water column even as the pump is not actually pumping itself. So it makes the, pump, the, the water more accessible to the pump. It makes it easier and faster to, to draw water. And this, this definitely shows up in the test. We, we did tests on the same well using both of the pumps. 
And for both of the pumps, actually, it increased the, the, um, the pumping and, and the fellows operating, they were paid according to the number of buckets they pumped. So they were not lazy, they were, they were pumping as hard as they could on a sustained basis. And incidentally, uh, the pump, the, uh, like this, this is right here. This situation is very easy pumping. I could pump this all day, but I'm lifting water maybe two feet. When you're lifting, say, 15 feet, it's hard work. So we found that uh, for continuous operation, you probably needed two operators. So that we did the same thing with, with the testing procedure. We paid them according to the, to the um, number of buckets that, that they could pump. And we found that for this situation, it increased the output by 50%, which is very significant. And I recognize that that, that benefit will not be as large if you have a shorter pipe and a, and a smaller lift. But for that situation, it worked. And, and it's, a, it's a standard feature of all the pumps that have gone in. I just want to add one thing in terms of uh, MCC volunteers around the world and over the, over the decades. Um, this is a project that resulted in very visible results. And people say, oh, George, you're a, you're a hero or you're a great guy for doing this. And I said, no, 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 just a minute here. There are many, many MCC volunteer heroes. Each of them ha had, did what they could, often in very innovative ways, in the situation that they were, that they were placed. They didn't have this kind of stuff to show, but in the end, they did just as valuable work as I did. 